Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Daniel. But before we do so, we take a moment of silence to make sure that you confess your sins and that you allow the Spirit of God to control you. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity, the very breath and time you've given us to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are in chapter 5 of Daniel. Chapter 4. I'm just going to write it, if you remember what we just studied in that. Chapter 5 is 20 years later. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar has died. His grandson's name is Belshazzar. Belshazzar. Don't confuse that with Daniel's Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. Think of the T in it. In fact, I think it had an E too, so it's Belteshazzar. Okay? That was Daniel. Okay? We're talking about Belshazzar. He's the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. All right? So. He's ruling over Babylon. He is the crown prince. Now, what does that mean? Well, his father is Nabonidus. He's actually the king. But he didn't like to stay in the capital city, which was also called Babylon. Remember, there was the Babylon Empire and there's a Babylon City. Um, just like Oklahoma, you have Oklahoma the state and Oklahoma City is the capital. Uh, New York is the state, but I think Albany is the capital. So that doesn't work for a good illustration, but Oklahoma City does. Okay, well, the king liked to stay in a place called Tima which is actually in Arabia. All right, so we're going to say Timia, Arabia. And he left basically the capital and his son to rule. So Nabonidus is the king. His son Belshazzar is the crown prince. And Belshazzar is the one that Daniel is going to deal with. The year is 539 B.C. A very big year for a number of reasons. A large empire called Persia is starting to move across the land, conquering armies conquering much of Babylon and it's moving in on the city itself. The king of Persia is a man by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus. Well, let's look at a map at Babylon for a moment. Nice, big, and red. That's Babylon. And if you look to the left of the word Babylon, you see Jerusalem. Okay? You look over to the right, and you can see the city Babylon. So the empire, or Babylonia, controlled all this red part. The capital was in Babylon. That is where 
Belshazzar was. Uh, Tima is not on the map, but as I recall, it's right over in, actually, it's in northern Arabia. So I'm going to say it's right over in here. Okay, it's southwest. Okay, I don't know if you can see that or not, but anyway, right around in the area, about below the Y on Babylonia. That's where Tima was. That's where the king liked to stay. But he let the country be run by his son, Belshazzar, in the capital. Now, let's draw kind of a hand map of this, all right? So here's the Mediterranean. Here's Jerusalem. Over here is the capital of Babylon. We'll just say Babylon, okay? The Persian army was moving in, starting to take over Babylon. Down here we'll put Tima. This is where the king Nabonidus was. And he had been leading the armies against Persia out in the field. Over in Babylon, his son Belshazzar was to defend the city. And that's what he was doing. He was defending the city as the Persians came down to conquer. Well, the forces of, Persian, of the Persian army was too much for Nabonidus, so he retreats back to Tima. So that's where he's at now, while his son is defending the city of Babylon. Now let's talk about the city of Babylon. Babylon was a very well fortified city. By that I mean it was one that would be very hard for anyone to get into and defeat. So the people in the city felt very secure. That is, they felt like no one could break down the walls and get to them. They had lots of food, uh, years of storage for food. And one of the big things that they need in those days is water. Let me picture it. Let's just say this is the walls. The walls are very thick and very high, okay? So we're going to give Babylon big, thick, high walls, all right? Let's say this is the this is the height of a man, okay? So they had big and they had moats around them too. You know what a moat is, right? Water to help protect it so people couldn't cross over it easily, so they had moats around it too in different places. The gates the gates were very well fortified. You know, that's usually the weak point where armies like to break in the gates. But they were very strong too. They had lots of gates that they defended. Now, how did they get water to drink in there? You say, well, maybe they drank moat water. But remember, that was outside the walls. They actually had a river flowing underneath the wall, one end and out the other. Okay? So if you were to go inside the wall and look down where the water came in, you might see something like this. So here's one side of the wall. And you would have the water flowing in underneath the wall. See? Now keep that in mind because that becomes important later on. So you have water flowing into your city from underneath the wall. Okay? The ancient historians tell us how thick and how high these walls were. So it was considered unbreachable. You know what that means? 
you can't breach the walls. You can't break down the walls. They're too high to go over. They're too thick to go through. And, of course, they'd have soldiers up here defending the wall, too. So it was a very well-fortified city. Well, <clears throat> Belshazzar decided that he was going to throw a party. That's right, even while there were enemy troops outside the wall. So outside the walls of Babylon, let's just make this a city of Babylon. We're going to make it really small. You had all the troops out here, okay? And they were all ready to attack, but they didn't have a way to get in. They had a general. His name was General Ug Baru. He got the idea that they could drain the waters of the river somehow. So what he did, remember I told you about the, the uh, water coming in? It came in through here and came out one end and went out the other. What he did, he probably put up a dam and made the waters go a different direction. So that what happened was this part dried up so that back under the wall, guess what? This would be dried up right in here so that what happened? His troops would go up underneath the wall where the river had been. Pretty sneaky. Well, that was in the plan. But while all the Persians Let's go back to where we were, our other map. <clears throat> While the Persians were outside the gates, inside, Belshazzar was having a party. So picture, inside this big old palace, surrounded by walls and defenses, they felt secure, not knowing that the Persian army had a plan to come in under the walls. Now, our story in Daniel 5 describes what happened at the party. Belshazzar decided to throw a big party, and he invited a thousand guests. These would be uh, what they called nobles, high officials, government leaders, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, people who ruled other areas of Babylon with their wives. And remember, Daniel's still around, 81 years old, but he's not at the party. No, Daniel had been set aside years before, uh, almost forgotten. We open... In chapter 5, verse 1. Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of his thousand guests. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now these vessels that they drank from, they call them goblets, they're the ones that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple Many years earlier, when they invaded Jerusalem and took captives away. So they've been stored away nearly 50 years. Let's go back for a moment and look at 2 Kings 24, 13. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed all the treasures from the temple of the Lord from the royal palace 
and took away all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had been made for the temple of the Lord. So, the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to remove all the treasures, and that included the gold articles and these goblets they're about to drink out of now at Belshazzar's party. Well, by now, after a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, we can expect that a lot of uh, Belshazzar's nobles were getting drunk, and he began thinking of these beautiful vessels that perhaps no one had used for almost 50 years now. So he sends for them to be brought to the party. The gold and silver drinking cups that were just to be used in the Jerusalem temple. Perhaps he thought that his guests would be amused or entertained by drinking out of these sacred vessels. And they could taunt, that is, make fun of the God of Israel by drinking from the vessels that were just supposed to be used for his worship. So what they did, they sent for these golden vessels and they came in, they brought them in, and Belshazzar and his guest began to drink from them. Now Daniel remembers writing the story. And surely they had many parties before this one. But this time they did something different. They brought in those sacred vessels that were supposed to be used just in the temple. In fact, if the Jewish people had known about it, they'd have probably got very angry over this blasphemous act. Verses 3 and 4. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. And they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. <clears throat> now remember Daniel's writing this. And he calls their gods, he calls their gods by these descriptions of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. You see, that's what they made the statues out of that they worshipped. And they thought that these statues represented their gods. But Daniel's telling us, all that is is gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So if you had a wooden statue, that's one you might keep in your house. It didn't cost as much as the gold or silver one. They would worship these things, and yet all they were was what they were made out of. You see? So Daniel tells us they took these sacred vessels, what we might call holy those that were set aside for the worship of God, and they used these vessels to praise their own false gods. So Belshazzar is also challenging God. Challenging God to do something about it. But remember, Who's outside the gates? The Persian army. Now, let's just pause a moment and go back about 25 years. Nebuchadnezzar's the ruler. And he had to learn a lesson or two about challenging God. Remember, he had been made to wallow, that means to stir around in the grass like an animal for like seven years. But he turned back to God and God brought him back to be king for a short time before he died. 
He realized what he had done wrong, and God let him rule a little longer. And if you remember, we saw how he declared to the people the greatness of God, the God of Israel. But now one of his own grandchildren, his grandson, was insulting the true God. Well, back to the party. They drank to their gods, and they had many. Some of the main ones, I'll just to let you know, were Marduk, Bel, Nebo, Ishtar, Maru, that was another one. And they drink to these gods, but these were all false gods, of course. There's only one true God. And remember, their statues are made out of gold and silver and wood and stone. So they would worship these images that they something appeared like a man every time. Isn't it funny how they make a god look like a man and they worship it? And all it is is a stone or, or wood. Seems ridiculous, but they were very serious about it. Okay? Well, while they were partying and drinking from these sacred goblets, taunting the God of Israel, verse 5, Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand came out of nowhere and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king was watching the back of the hand that did the writing. So while they were drunk and drinking with these goblets to their false gods, at that moment, a hand appeared so that the light would be on the hand, the lampstand light would be on the hand, and they could see that it was writing on the wall. Now, don't you think that must have really scared them? And suddenly from hollering and laughing and screaming and drinking, they just all stopped. And they saw this hand. I bet you couldn't hear anything but goblets drop as his hand began to write in the plaster of the wall. You could probably hear the scratching. And then the hand disappeared. Verse 6. We get to look at what the king was doing. Then the countenance, that means color, of the king's face changed, and his thoughts were alarming him, and the joints of his limbs became weak, and his knees began, began knocking together. I mean, if they made this into a movie, it would probably be pretty funny. He would turn white. You know, when people get really scared, the, the blood drains out of their face, and they get pale. So his face changed colors. He was getting scared. It says his thoughts were alarming him. His weak, his joints of his limbs became weak. He was probably about to faint. But his knees were knocking together. Now that's real fear. He was terrified. He must have been thinking about what he had been doing. That he knew that he had just taken the vessels that were just supposed to be used in the temple and now they were drinking them to their own gods. He wasn't stupid. He knew that these vessels came from the temple in Jerusalem. But you see, he was ignoring the God of Israel and even Israel 
challenging him. So now there's a writing right in front of his own eyes on his own wall at one of his parties. But he didn't know what it meant. He needed to know. He could see it, but he couldn't understand it. Now the letters were recognizable. And he saw the words, but did not know what it meant. Kind of like a riddle. So what's he do? Well, he does what kings usually do. Verse 7. The king called out loud. He must have screamed to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, any man who can read this inscription, that means the writing on the wall, and explain its interpretation to me, shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and be third ruler in the kingdom. Don't these lines sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like some of the things that Nebuchadnezzar said when he wanted his dreams interpreted? Uh, for example, back in chapter 2? Sure. We've seen this before. In fact, we know about these people, these conjurers and Chaldeans and diviners. They're the ones that are supposed to have the special ability to interpret these types of things from the gods. So Belshazzar has them all called in and let them interpret it. He says whoever can do it, they're going to get honored with a purple robe, a gold necklace, and promotion to third ruler. And remember, he was only second, right? His father, Nabonidus, was the king. He's second, and he would give third rule to the person who could interpret this writing. This tells us how, how important it was to him to get it interpreted. Verse 8. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. So we see that all the wise men came in. Now let me ask you a question. Who's missing? Daniel. You see, Daniel is no longer in charge of the wise men, or even considered one of the wise men, at least who's working. It looks like he's been retired. He's been set aside, perhaps for many years now. So the king calls in everybody he thinks might be able to interpret it. But they couldn't do it either. Now we're going to learn what made this so difficult to interpret. But it's not in a foreign language. It's actually written in their own language. It just it didn't make any sense to them. It was like a riddle. So, they get a message from God during this party. And none of the king's wise men could interpret it. Now let me ask you this. Who do you think is going to know how to interpret it? Daniel. So this was all in God's plan. Because Daniel was still around. God knew that they were going to call in Daniel. So... God gives them a message they can interpret, and now 
Daniel, who's on the, uh, or in the city, probably even in the palace, is going to be called in. So Daniel is still there, and God's going to use him again. Now, one more time, let's remember. There they are at the party. They're having a good old time. Then this hand appears. A message is written on the wall. Outside the gates are the enemies. And they're drinking wine from the sacred cups. Well, if you had been the king and you started thinking about all this stuff, this hand appeared, the enemies outside, and this this must have really scared him. It's just going to get worse. Verse 9. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His countenance changed even more, and his nobles were perplexed. You see, even his own man couldn't figure this out. What was he going to do? He had to have the message interpreted. It must be from the gods. And this tells us that he got even more scared. He got more pale. And the nobles, all these party guests, were perplexed. That means to be confused about what was going on. So now they're probably looking at the king and saying, What are you going to do, king? This writing makes no sense to anybody, yet it came from some sort of God, at least in their viewpoint. A king wasn't supposed to throw a party, then get himself so scared and confuse his guest. It was supposed to be a time of fun. But they weren't having much fun at this point. You can imagine they're saying, what kind of party is this? And remember, the enemy troops are just outside the walls. So the tension and the fear are continuing to grow. And in our next lesson, we're going to see what happens next. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this great story that tells us about your work again in the lives of people like Daniel. And might we learn from him and from your word how we are to live in very difficult times as did Daniel. Lord, we ask that we'll have open hearts to your truth, that your spirit will challenge us. In Jesus' name, amen.